Collective Whisper Podcast with Simon King. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Collective Whisper podcast. I am your host, Simon Kay, and we're glad to have you along on board. We hope you're enjoying the guests so far. We love interesting people. We love talking to them. So hopefully there's somebody for you. This week, I'm going to talk to Eleanor Shanley. Eleanor Shanley is one of Ireland's most loved and respected vocalists. In her long and rich career, we have enjoyed Eleanor's many solo performances and recordings in addition to her body of work from her wonderful collaborative projects, both recordings and live performances. A beautiful career in itself with Didanen marked Eleanor's baptism to her professional career, her fondly remembered period working with good friend and Irish icon Ronnie Drew, Mike Hanrahan and her work with Donna Lunny. Garrett East and longtime friend and leading classical guitarist John Feely are just a few names from many. Across her collection, of projects, Eleanor Shanley has truly spread her wings and enjoyed mixing up the sounds within the folk and traditional music genres. And on her most recent album, Cancion de Amor, with John Feely, we also get to enjoy some beautiful classical arrangements. Renowned for her unique interpretation of Irish and root songs, Eleanor has been at the top of her profession since joining the Dan and in addition to a number of collaborative projects since, Eleanor has recorded many solo albums including Desert Heart, A Place of My Own, and 2015's Forever Young, from which her single, the Tom Moore classic, Gorgeous and Bright, was the most played track on RT Radio 1 in the same summer. Eleanor has worked alongside many other great musicians through the years and also recorded with the Dubliners, Sharon Shannon, Donald Lunny, U2, and too many more, both at home and internationally to mention here. Her time working with Ronnie Drew was a very special time in her life, and this is a friendship she treasured. They recorded two albums together, A Couple More Years and El Amor de Mi Vida, which was recorded shortly before Ronnie died. Eleanor and Ronnie performed live together on many occasions also. Welcome to the show, Eleanor Shanley. So, Eleanor Shanley, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm very good, Simon. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome. It's, it's great to have Irish artists on the show. I'm a musician and a, a music lover at heart, so I try to get all kinds of artists from across the whole specter of music, whether it be pop, rock, metal, you name it, we'll have them on the show. That's healthy. Because I think everybody has something to give, and you've given a lot to Irish music over the last few years. Well, I've been at it a long time, so hopefully I've given something. I'm 43, 34 years in the business now. Wow. Yeah, they don't really give out gold watches or anything for that length of time in the music business. But, I mean, there are accolades and stuff, but you kind of have to work hard nonetheless, don't you? You do have to work hard. But, you know, I worked in an office for many years and nobody ever kind of applauded when I finished the day's work. But, you know, when you're in this business, you finish your concert, everybody gives you a round of applause. So that's accolade enough for me. For you, do you feel that the music business has changed a lot now? Oh, jeepers, yes, it has. I mean, when I started with De Danon all those years ago, the first album I made was on vinyl. There were no CDs at that stage. And, you know, very few people were actually making albums. So in a way, it was a lot easier. But now everything has changed because people are making albums in their front room. You know, everybody's making a CD or whatever it is now. And it's all online. So in, in one way, it's more difficult because you have all that competition out there, if you want to call it for want of a better word. Um, and in another way, it's great because it's giving um, a voice to people who would never have been heard back in the day. You know, people who can really perform but would never have the wherewithal to make an album or record. So it's good. I think in some ways, technology is good in lots of ways. But in, in other ways, then you have this thing where if everybody's doing it, it dilutes the waters a little bit, you know. So it's not to say that these people aren't talented. The point is that one time you had to show your talent, prove it, and work hard, do the shows, and then get your spot. But nowadays, sometimes the hardworking musicians can put in all the time and then see somebody else make it who, as you said, is in their front room and hasn't put in the work but maybe is discovered. Absolutely. And that's all these um, reality shows, competitions, you know, people who become a star overnight. Yeah. I always think that's hard to take for musicians because what happens is, you know, you put in years and years of work and uh, let's say you see these talent shows and for a lot of people, they say, oh, would you, you know, they say to musicians, would you go on that talent show or would you do this? And they're like saying, no, I wouldn't do that kind of thing. So the, the point is that it's hard. It, it's hard to know which avenue to go down all the time, you know. And um, the 
the I think I think for a lot of people they want to be successful but they're not they're not willing to take those avenues. Yes, exactly. And you have to work hard. But I think the truth will out in the end. You know, I think the longevity will come to people who, who really are working, you know, and rather than being a no one hit wonder kind of thing and disappearing because you haven't put the work in. And that's why I'm I'm happy, really happy that 33 years later, I'm still working, you know, and I have no intention to put up in the near future. Let's go back a little. You're from County Leitrim and we had uh, another yeah, you know, Leitrim person on Charlie McGettigan on this show two seasons ago. And tell us about growing up in Leitrim. Well, I was born in a tiny little village called Kesh Carrigan, and at that time it had only a population of 19 people. Okay. And now there's a few hundred in it, I think, because of all the building and boom and all of that. A lovely little village where everybody knew everybody. And uh, in my family, my mother and her sisters and her brother were all. Beautiful singers. Never in- played instruments. It was always singing. So uh, there'd be parties in the various houses, you know, Christmas and whatever. And whether you could sing or not, you'd have to sing. And we'd all have to have our little party piece ready. And my aunts and uncle used to teach me songs. And that's where it kind of all started. And it's a beautiful country because it's all kind of uh, lakes and rivers, you know, and hills. Lovely Shlevenir and more. She begs she more. The famous O'Carolan piece. That was where I'm kind of half a mile down the road from where that was written. Okay, wow, that's nice. Steeped in history. Yeah. When did you, you know, you you were probably started singing before you started playing instruments, I imagine. And when did you kind of say, I want to have the guitar to accompany me? When did that kind of come into play? I think when I was about 12. Okay. And I can still remember, I, you know, throwing tantrums. I wanted a guitar because, you know, I wanted to sing. But uh, my father, anyway, went into Gerrity's and Carrick and Shannon, shop that there and um, he arrived home with this guitar in a kind of a cardboard box the shape of you know oh yeah like they look sometimes like coffins exactly oh I can still <laughs> remember the smell of the guitar coming out of that I was so happy yeah but it was the worst guitar on the planet because the strings were like way up, up from the frets yeah it was really yeah the action was really high and everything in it oh god and the, my fingers were all covered in blisters for years and it was bad in a way because when I was trying to learn it then I used to lose interest in it because my fingers were so sore but then years later I bought a guitar myself and that's it I'm not a great player I wouldn't kind of I think you're pretty proficient I've, I've seen your videos and everything your nice melodies on the guitar and the important thing I think with music and being a musician and playing instruments it's sometimes it's a vehicle for the voice or you know, you'll get some people that are more technical, but then maybe they don't have the voice, you know. So sometimes people, they have both, but then sometimes people only have one. And one, they might say, oh, I play the guitar, but it's just to accompany myself. I leave it to other people. So it's a great instrument in that way, isn't it? Exactly. I'd be one of these who plays the guitar just to accompany myself. But I would re- certainly re- rely on the really good guitar players then for to accompany me on stage and indeed recording tell me then so as a teenager growing up you know did you have other hobbies and things sports or anything that you were into or was art or was it always music art was a big thing for me and it was certainly art and english would have been my best subjects in school and uh, i did art for kind of some time but then when i left school i left behind and didn't paint for a long time until i came to balna okay and I joined an art group and then I did an online course in abstract art through lockdown and I'm still doing it. And I I love it. I absolutely love it. So I kind of, the art is taking as much time now as my music. Right. And do you find one kind of, uh, I don't want to say challenges the other, but gives inspiration to the other? One definitely gives inspiration to the other. Yeah. And even in my approach to it, I find that art makes me focus more on my music as well you know for some reason it's kind of motivates me to do things when you're in the middle of let's say an art session do you kind of get ideas for music and inspiration does it has it channeled has it opened a new channel I shall I say for music in a way I think it has because you can be doing the same musical thing for a long time and it's good to have that something else in the creative mind to to focus on too and one helps the other along at the moment anyway 
Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and you know they're they're kind of deeply intertwined. Sometimes in different arts. You know, we can look at poetry yeah. and look at song and say, okay, they're they're, yes. they're very heavily connected. You know, and you can some famous poems Raglan wrote have been turned into beautiful songs. But sometimes with art as well, there's great inspiration. And whether it be the art of a movie or you know a, a play or a picture or a painting that have inspired people to write something because maybe they see something in it and then it makes them think, okay, you know, there's a story there, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. And just when you mentioned play, uh, drama was a big thing for me as well when I was uh, growing up. And I spent years studying in Betty Ann Norton's School of Speech and Drama in Dublin when I moved to Dublin first. Okay. So, um, yeah. So all round you had that artistic flair, but it's knowing which path to choose, isn't it? I think it's more the path chose me because Daydanan found me singing kind of in a, in a session in the corner of the Merchant Pub. And that then just took me over. And that's I went off in that direction. I was happy to follow. How old were you then when that happened? Oh, gosh, I was in my 20s at that stage. OK, and tell us the lead up to that. So you were singing in sessions and just playing with different people in different places and what did Dan and walked in or there was it was a special event or what was it? I used to sing at sessions in the Merchant Pub on the Keys here in Dublin and uh, uh, Ned O'Shea and Frank, oh his name is gone, heard me singing and they, they were, Dolores had just left Dan at the time and they knew Dan and were looking for a singer. So Frank Cooney was his name actually and they're both, they've both passed on but um, Frank, I remember he met me and he had a, one of those cassette recorders and he recorded me singing a song on the cassette recorder and then he sent it down to Alex Finn and Frankie Gavin of Didana. And a couple of weeks later, I went down and met them in Galway. And two weeks later, I was off to Finland, Sweden and Wales with them. Wow. It was that sudden. And you said you used to work in an office. So at that time, you were working in an office. Yeah, it was a big change because I was working in what was uh, Foss in Bagot Street, Anko. It was that time. And uh, I came back and just, I knew I, I, I was going. That was it. So gave up the permanent pensionable job to head off. It's hard, isn't it? Because I think, you know, musicians at their core sometimes would give up everything for the dream or everything for that life and for it to be successful. But then other people who only, you know, want that stability and don't want to take chances, maybe don't have that artistic side to it. So it, it's a hard choice sometimes, isn't it? It is a hard choice. And I think for some people as well, I mean, if you have family, if you have children, I hadn't children at that time and still don't have children so in a way it was easier for me to choose the to go and kind of live you know because you don't you're not getting a wage at the end of the week that's one thing like when I was in the the permanent job you always knew you had your wage coming in at the end of the week this is so much more you wouldn't need to be going into the music business for money so when you went off and you were doing that tour okay and you were like you said Sweden Finland Wales so that was like a big culture shock to you, no? Oh, absolutely. Totally. In every way, because um, the holidays would have been just going to like a beat or something for a week or, you know. Sun holidays. So, yeah, exactly. This kind of travel was completely different. And definitely, I'd say for at least the first year, I was a tourist more than a, a singer because I was just loving all this traveling around, all kind of seeing different places. Did you have to change your style for, you know? Uh, musically. Yes. Well, I was always a fan of Did Annan, so I would have sung songs like Sweet Forget Me Not and Nadine and songs like that um, in those days. So not really. And I brought my own songs to it then, you know, kind of um, like you, the one you mentioned there, Raglan Road and songs like that, you know. It's very much my style because my mother and like her, as I said, her sister, that it would have been traditional songs they would be handing down anyway. So yeah, it would be folk and traditional I was doing. Oh, I love country music as well. That time when you were like attempting to leave, did you have some people saying to you, oh, go for it? And other people maybe saying, oh, geez, don't give up the job. You know, I'm sure you had people on both sides of the fence, no? Do you know something? Not one person said to me, don't do it, including my family, including my parents. Really? They were completely on side and they knew that's what I wanted to do. Okay, that's good. And I suppose also the Dan and were at a, a good kind of level in the music business at that time. So it was everyone, even people I worked with in, in Anko, like the director general at the time, Jerry Kelly said, if you don't take this opportunity, you're madder than I ever thought you were. And Anko, that, when you, you just mentioned an Anko there, I, I do explain to people sometimes because when I, when I was like 15, I did a carpentry apprenticeship and I had to go to Anko 
and I was doing like and and now it's false obviously but that time it was Anko and it was it was when people obviously weren't academic or they had an interest in trades and stuff it was the thing and there was hairdressers and there was everything so it's it's a different type of creativity that was going on in there absolutely I'm sure, yeah, it's when you were working in that kind of environment too, chances didn't come up like that for people sometimes in those areas, no? Not at all. I mean, I was totally, um, I didn't know anyone in the music business. I really didn't. I didn't. So to kind of try and get there, I wouldn't have a clue where to go, how to start, anything like that. And the only thing I used to go to the odd sessions. So it was, it was fate. It really was fate. Was it something then as well that, when you left and, and you were also going working with people that you hadn't known before, so they were all kind of strangers, was that a bit daunting? Uh, it was because uh, you're just as you, like going off for a few weeks with total strangers. I'd only met them maybe once or twice before I went away with them. And I didn't know. But actually, I settled in very quickly. And I like people and I like, I've always liked meeting new people anyway. So that part was easy enough but for quite a while I was the only girl in the band as well but then Caroline Lavelle the cellist she was in the band for some time with me and that was great it was nice to have you okay okay so when you went on tour then that lifestyle was it like hotels and B&Bs and all of this and playing in different towns hotels and playing in different towns and going to the states and you know traveling like at four o'clock in the morning from gig to gig in the states and in the snow and <laughs> all that kind of thing and in those days I, th- I still wow. thought that was glamorous I don't think it's that glamorous now I have to say it's, it's, but it's exciting it was exciting wasn't it yes it's exciting and I was young and just great to be seeing new places and meeting all these people you know it was great and how how did your, you know, like your craft or singing, because the thing about it is when anybody takes over from somebody else, and especially with Dolores Kane and everything, it's quite difficult because you're thinking to yourself, will I emulate their singing? Will I do my own singing? Will I have a mixture of both? And that's a quite a difficult isn't one, isn't it? It is, but I very much did my own thing. And I, the lads in the band, that's what they wanted as well. And, you know, sometimes in a band like that, when you go abroad, people don't really know who the, the, the singers, they couldn't name the singers and musicians in certain places. So they don't really know if they've changed singer or not. They know the band by a name. But that, that was kind of comforting in a way because I didn't, well, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Dolores Keynes to this day. So I wouldn't even think of trying to emulate her or do the songs that Dolores did, you know? Yes, yes, yes. It's such a distinctive way of... Do- so I wanted to just be myself and do my own thing. Yeah, and it's it's hard, isn't it? Because you, you have to just go in and be yourself and you have to kind of hope that what you're doing is, you know, good enough for what they want. And um, it's it's quite hard, isn't it? It's quite hard to take over and... I've had some people obviously have been connected on the show. We had, for example, Ruth Dillon, who used to sing. She sings with the Rains now, but she used to sing with Dolores and everything. That's right. Yes. Yeah. And the thing is, I, I think it's hard. But if you make your own stamp on it and you can kind of show that you're the one for the job, you can, you know, you, you can really change people's opinions too can't you absolutely absolutely and people they accept you you know they accepted me at that time so i i was lucky and i just stayed five years with the dan and then i wanted to go and really do my own thing so potted off then my own journey and then from there so to speak were you thinking what do i do where's my next move what's my choices here or did you need a break from it no i wanted to do a solo album and that's exactly what i went out to do and was that daunting itself in its own way I got I was lucky because I had a deal with Warners so financially it was I was fine you know I did two albums with them so right you know that kind of took the pressure off but you know I, like again I was young I was kind of really interested and excited by the whole journey so it seemed a natural thing to do a natural progression just to do my own album so I never I don't think no, I never found it daunting or it was just natural let's say a lot of the songs you sing are from a kind of across different styles so You have, you know, full country roots, different things. So when you were doing your own stuff then, was it hard to make those choices of what would be on the album? Yeah, and it still is. It still is. Because I have so much different styles of music that I love. I mean, I did the whole gospel album as well, and I love singing with gospel singers. So what I do is just do songs I really 
want to do and hope for the best because otherwise I'm kind of if I'm doing deliberately doing something to go in a certain direction I'd feel that I'm not being true to myself and not being true to the audience so for me it's important to do songs I love whatever genre they come from and I tend to fall into the folk and traditional category anyway uh, with the odd country song thrown in yeah because I think that's the thing about Irish folk, people sometimes say, well, Irish country is different to American country. You have different levels of like how singers are. Some Irish country singers are more like American singers. But then you have some artists who kind of go between folk and country and they have a different style, don't they? Yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I probably would lean certainly more towards American country. Right. As I love Femi Lou Harris. And then in the folk, I love uh, John Baez, Leonard Cohen, all that kind of stuff, you know, always have done who would be, I mean, when you were growing up, you know, and you first kind of started listening to music, who were your main inspirations and influences? Definitely when I started buying my own music and all of that, it would have been uh, Joan Baez for sure. Uh, and Emily Lou, the ones I've mentioned. Edith Piaf I've always loved. Okay. I like the kind of women singers, kind of strong women singers. Delia Murphy. Yeah. Mayo, County Mayo. And then Leonard Cohen. I would have loved Leonard Cohen. The Dubliners. I love the Dubliners. And that's, I was thrilled then when I ended up singing with Ronnie. Yeah, yeah. That, that was Absolutely. kind of like a childhood dream then. I mean, because sometimes they say never meet your idols, but in that case, it worked out. Oh, it worked out. He was fabulous. He really was. He was just, I loved working with him. And I miss him to this day. Yeah, I mean, he was such a big influence on Irish society and, and Irish music, wasn't he? And I, I think what it was, he's a big loss now. And like we, we look back in those times, you know, with Luke Kelly when he was here. And I think Ronnie Drew was the same kind of loss, wasn't he, to Irish music? Absolutely. And in Ronnie, everybody knew him. Yes. Everybody. You couldn't walk down the street with Ronnie. Be, hello, Ronnie. Hello, Ronnie. Hello, Ronnie. It was kind of. Yeah. I, I, I think it was difficult, wasn't it? Yeah, because he was a distinctive look and his voice, everything about him. But uh, he was great. When you were doing your solo stuff and you, as you said, you never imagined one day you'd sing with Ronnie Drew. But how did that kind of connection come about then? Like, did you sing together and you just had a chemistry together or what? What happened was the Dubliners were doing their 30 years of Grayan album. And oh. I was with Dead Annan at the time. And again, it was luck and fate because they invited Dead Annan to be part of the 30 years of Grayan album. And I was the singer. Okay. So I did Boots of Spanish Leather with Ronnie and um, oh, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? Oh, yeah. That's a great song. Great song. Yeah. Great song. And then a couple of years later, I had left it, Annan, after that. And myself and Ronnie were going to were invited to Finland to do a festival. And there was a reception in the Finnish embassy in Dublin for this festival. I can't even remember what the festival was. But we met up again at the festival and we started chatting and Mike, Han Mike Hanrahan was there at the time as well. We started chatting and we said, why don't we try doing some work together? And then we became great friends, both myself, Ronnie and Mike, and I still work with Mike. You know, as you were working with Ronnie through the years then and maybe his health was deteriorating, was that different then over the years, I imagine? It was, it was. And uh, uh, it, it was sad in the end, you know. But uh, he was very brave and he was he was like up at, uh, we were with him to like in the week he was dying. <laughs> he still, all he wanted to do was go down and have a, a cigar. He wanted to have a cigar. Um, the very thing that killed him, really. Yeah, well, I suppose it's like, you know, it's when a smoker sometimes have, they, they say, well, look, it's done this to me now, but I want to enjoy it because I always enjoyed it, isn't it? It, it might have, you know... Um, I, you know, I always remember that story when, when George Best got the liver transplant and the first thing when he got out of hospital, he wanted to go to the pub because they kind of like, they kind of have this idea. Okay. You can't change that about me. You can change the internal parts or fix me up, but you're not going to change that about me. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, that must've been the way it was with Ronnie. Yeah. It was too late to change at that time, but, uh, too late yeah and even singing with Ronnie creatively I loved the creative side of it because he was very professional he he we'd rehearse everything over and over and over and over again even stage moves because he loved acting he wanted to be an actor yeah more than a singer he'd want to go over everything thoroughly absolutely and even the walk on walk off stage you know wow yeah was that something had you seen that with other performers or that were kind of like theater like no no 
absolutely not not nothing like that that it was just kind of go on do your concert take your bow go off but everything with ronnie was the introductions to the songs we rehearsed we had scripted them we rehearsed them everything like that so there were those and it, he made it look kind of natural you know when you start working with somebody like that and they have their own kind of way of doing stuff and you bring songs to the table and you have them in your own keys and stuff. Did you find then when you're with this kind of artist, you're like, OK, I, I better do everything to kind of please them. And was that kind of difficult or did you kind of find your own ground where you stood your ground? We utterly both respected each other and respected each other because yeah, we had our keys were so different. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Like he was one end and I'm the other end. But again, that was the thing we worked on together to either harmonize or, you know, move around the keys, but was out of total respect for each other. So that it was never an issue. It was fun, actually. Yeah, because it's a big difference in your ranges. And I mean, sometimes with the lower voices and the higher voices, you can you can get great harmonies and everything. But it's you have to work on it, don't you, as well? A hundred percent. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of work, and but it's a lovely thing. It's a lovely thing. It took a lot, and Ronnie was very open to ideas and new ideas and new music. You know, we were doing songs by the Eels and things like that, and he he wouldn't bat an eyelid at doing things like that. He just he had that openness with his singing and everything. Yeah, and a sense of adventure in his music. Yes, yes. Tell us, you know, you've recorded with so many artists: Sharon Shannon, Eddie Reader, Tommy Fleming, and so. You know, a song I know that, you know, is uh, you, you do wonderfully. And I think you might sing her first, the Galway to Graceland and everything. There's um, it's tell us about like working with some of those artists and, and then them rubbing off on you in your own performances. Well, I've always loved collaborating and I still do. I, I really love it because, again, I find it is it, creatively really interesting and working with people like Sharon. Sharon and I are great friends, you know. It's just, it's great. And we have great fun, apart from anything else, kind of doing stuff together. Uh, Eddie Reader, of course, wonderful. That was on my Elner Shanley and Friends album, and which I, I, Colin Hind, I don't know if you knew him, he used to run the Celtic Connection Festival in Glasgow. And I remember uh, we were good pals and I rang him, was telling us, doing an album called Elner Shanley and Friends. And he says, oh, that'll be a solo effort then. <laughs> <laughs> It was that loads of people. Actually, the other one that I, uh, um, his song I loved in that album was uh, Ray Lynam. Oh, Ray Lynam, yeah. Yeah. We did all fall down together. I get that sense from you that, as you said, you love working with people like that. So once I suppose you stepped into the Dan and, and you started working with people, you got a great joy from it. And that, that was to continue through the years, the collaborations, no? Yes. To this day, at the moment, I'm working with uh, John Feely, the classical guitar player. Yes, great guitar player. Oh, he's wonderful. And again, that's an interesting thing because kind of the folk and traditional with the classical side is quite a revelation for me as well, you know. The thing about it is when you look at even sometimes these players, like I was watching the other night, Dominic Miller, you know, he's a Sting's guitarist. He has that kind of classical background, but then obviously putting it into pop and contemporary music. And then you see him playing jazz with it and stuff. These guitar players, they have that phenomenal talent and they can cross over to into any genre, you know, within reason. And sometimes like that, when you see them playing traditional or folk, it's great, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. It really is. And it's, but people like that, they are geniuses, so they can do anything, you know? Let's talk about, I know this obviously, I'm living in Spain and I see there with some of your titles, Canción de Amor and El Amor de la Vida and stuff like this. We had recently on the show, we had Eleanor McAvoy, another Eleanor. What's, what was the song she sang again? If I think of the title. Oh yeah, the Spanish word for heart is Corazón, this song she sings. When you have traveled around the world like you have and play in different places, sometimes that culture rubs off on you too, doesn't it? The Spanish thing, El Amor de la Vida, Ronnie was a fluent Spanish speaker. Okay, I didn't know that. He was. And to the point that he knew local dialects. Okay, wow. And years ago, he taught English as a foreign language in Spain. Yes. Okay, okay. So there's probably like, you probably meet lots of Spanish yeah, people yeah, around yeah. saying, hell yeah. Yeah, hell oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, hell oh, yeah. But uh, that's where that came from. And then Canción de Amor was written by Brendan Graham. Okay, yeah, yeah. He uh, raised me up for him. And we, John and I had the album finished. And we got this song. We said, we, we've, we've, Brendan sent it to us. 
so we couldn't we had to do it because we loved it so much so we delayed releasing the album then to record that particular song but definitely um even when i was with the dan and doing the 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 gospel work that i that was such an enjoyable experience and that's a whole other kind of part as well of of music that i wouldn't have been open to before that you know or i wouldn't have known anything about really and and t- tell us about Garadice or Garadice. How do you pronounce that? Garadice. Garadice. Tell us about that. So you have... Garadice is actually a lake in Leitrim. Okay. That's why we call the land Garadice. But that came about, I was invited some years ago to spearhead a project called the Leitrim Equation, which was to preserve and search for old Leitrim music, you know. And we found lots of kind of really old stuff that hadn't been heard in hundreds of years but that was there, there was poet Vincent Woods involved in that Drina Guckey and dancer Donna Lunny was with us um, but myself John McCartan guitar player Dave Sheridan on flute whistle uh, Paul McGovern on pipes we were part of that Leitrim equation and then uh, when it finished we decided that we'd set up our own band and we recorded our with the advice of Donna Lunny our first album Garadice we're working on the second one now but um yeah, another collaboration I'm really enjoying, you know. <laughs> it was the first album. It was more like of a local thing, wasn't it, too, that had, for, you know, further reaches. Exactly. It was a local thing that just got feet. And uh, we've, in fact, we did a lovely concert in north of Spain just before lockdown. We had a wonderful time. Yeah. Do you find that I noticed there when you were talking about the Dan and, and going to Finland and Sweden, was there a time there, you know, in, when you were in your 20s and you were touring around, was there certain countries that you went to more often than others? Denmark would certainly be one of them. And the Danes seem to have taken me to their hearts big time. So I go to Denmark a couple of times a year now. And uh, they're bringing okay. me out to the festivals. Yeah, I, I really, I love it. I love I have so many good places in Denmark now. Scandinavian people are different to the Irish people in some ways, but similar in others. But I think at the beginning, it's, it's sometimes I find that they're slower to warm up, you know, but then once they do, they're really nice people. Absolutely. And but the thing, different one big difference is if they say four o'clock, it's not it's four o'clock on the dot. Irish people were like <laughs> ah, four ish. Yeah, we have a bit of the Spanish in us, you know, it's like later, later, mañana. Yes, it's absolutely. And I actually, I did a few tours of Denmark by train and uh, that was extraordinary because if you were trying to do a tour of Ireland by train, you could be in trouble with time wise and, you know, it, it just wouldn't work with delays and God knows what, but there it was just clockwork. Yeah. So let's let's talk a little about, you know, the Cancion de Amor and I know you recorded in Air Court in Galway and, you know, um, so was that an album that you went into with kind of an idea of what you wanted to do or did it change completely? And did you do a lot of kind of pre-planning or pre-production before you actually went to record? We did a lot of pre-planning and a lot of pre-production because I, John Feely, I had met him once about 27 years ago when I was touring with the Dannon. I met him in a train station in England. We were on tour and he was on tour and he came over and introduced himself to us. And I hadn't met him since then until he was doing a concert here in Balnaslow about five years ago. And I went to the concert and we struck up friendship, you know, and a couple of yes. people advised us that, you know, said, why don't you two do something together, you know? So we got together and we spent a long time researching songs finding songs and it took a long time to do the album because we did it in Melik Church John engineered it in the church so we the church, thankfully they were so kind to us in the church the, the pre, parish priest he um, gave us the church with the only people that would be in the odd time would be a couple of tourists would come in to because the, a very old church is the oldest church in use in priory in use in Europe and it's really beautiful oh wow I didn't know that okay yeah so we searched for search for songs. Yeah, I'm looking actually at your thing. Yeah, it's it's fourteen fourteen. Wow. Yeah, it's old. Yeah, it's really old. Was that something that added to the essence of the album? Then the church and yeah, it did. Yeah, because it's very different recording in a church. It's a, it's a, a different energy, and I think in a way the songs they're not spiritual songs, but they kind of felt more spiritual when we we're doing them. So, very spiritual experience doing the whole thing the songs then we i mean we've rehearsed so many songs and you know pretty much immediately if a song is not going to work particularly when it's such a different energy john's classical guitar playing and my 
pork and tread. Yeah, that something I'm curious because, you know, let's say a lot of Irish playing would be in dad gad or in D tuning and this stuff. And then, but the way, you know, I, he's an amazing guitar player and he can adapt. But there's probably a point that's in some songs where you kind of go, oh, can we do that more of this way or do the other? So you have to really work out some things, don't you? And I would certainly left the guitar playing to him and the decisions to him yeah yeah and it just again because i think we're true to ourselves it gelled you know yes we yes he wasn't trying to be something else nor was i it was a merging of styles wasn't it, it was, exactly yeah and then when it comes to bringing in like you had lots of guest musicians on the album and stuff when you bring in other musicians do you kind of try and take them from both sides then or more from the traditional side and the, the folk side both sides Definitely both sides. Both musicians sides. I would have known and then musicians that John would have worked with. But I suppose it did tend more to be from the classical side because we contempo string quartet in there in quite a few songs. And because th that's the style the album, the direction the album went in. And even when we do our concerts, and I love doing live gigs with John, it does lean a bit more towards the his classical guitar playing than than it would be folk here, Traddy. Even sounds open trad, yeah. When you were recording in the church because of, you know, the surroundings and the acoustics and everything, for some songs I imagine it's perfect. You're like, Oh, it's amazing the acoustics. But then maybe others you don't want that on it. So how were you able to isolate it for when you needed it? Like did you have to use lots of dampeners and, you know, box in rooms? How did you kind of work when you didn't want the big room feel? No, it was the way John mic'd it. Really, it worked, and we okay. didn't box the room in at all. But he had several mics, and it at different right. um, distances from we were on the altar. So they mics he very close to you, and some right way back. Yeah, and I suppose it's a lot of discovery to work finding out what works where and so on, and experience because you know he has probably done this a lot before in that style. Exactly. But you can see how. With some artists, they might say, we're looking for this kind of reverb hall effect, natural sound, and we want to go to a cathedral or we want to go to a hall, some kind of a, and you go there. But then on the other songs, maybe you don't want that. And it, maybe it's harder to get rid of. So I can imagine when you're doing the whole album in the church, I could envisage that you might have problems with the acoustics being in the way sometimes. I think, as you said there, you're right to point out, John, John is so used. He only records in churches most of the time. Right. He does very little studio recording. Right. Uh, mainly because the guitar sounds better with that, the classical guitar sounds better with that, that church sound. But, yes. Um, no, and the way he did it, the only song we did do in studio was uh, Can't See Young Day More because we had been out in search at that stage. So we did that in Ventry Studios up in North. Okay. And... You know, very little difference in the sound, really, of the church sound and the, the Ventry sound. Um, the engineer of Ventry managed to kind of work it so it sounded like the other tracks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's all that engineering is a skill in itself, of course. Of course, yeah. And for you then, like being a vocalist in the church, I mean, was that something that really gave you more power as well having those acoustics on hand oh, and yeah. being able to express yourself i imagine was great oh absolutely i mean there's nothing singing in a church is just fabulous yeah anyway and uh, yeah it, it gives more power doesn't it to us yeah and when there's when a church is empty and you have all this beautiful reverb natural reverb it's fabulous tell us then about you know you know you you would have been more used to recording in studios so for you did you have to adapt yourself in any way for that church environment recording? I was more comfortable actually in the church because sometimes in a studio you feel quite hemmed in or kind of, it's more tense. And you're restricted. For me, yeah, it's, yeah you're more restricted. It's more tense in a studio. Whereas it, with that church sound, it's there's something much more natural about it. Yes. It's almost like there's no audience there. It's like you are performing for an audience. That's why yeah. I have I, I hated lockdown doing, you know, when you had to do online gigs during lockdown. Yes, yes, so yes. Not yeah. natural, not natural when there's no audience. And when you, you think of the normal kind of studio environment, you know, you can have a vocal booth. And even if it's a big studio and a big vocal booth, you have a certain amount of space 
And so even when you're kind of trying to come up with ways of singing or, you know, saying, let me run through this a few times or whatever, you're walking within that vocal booth. So the great thing about being in an open air space or a church or somewhere, you can kind of say, look, hold on, I need to I need to change that note. I need to come up with something. And you can take a walk down the aisle and sing and then and hum it and then come back. And you're not restricted at all, are you? That's 100 percent right. Yeah, it's just it's just certainly to me, it's much more freeing to record that way. Yeah, yeah. But uh, whether I can do it again, well, I say myself and John will do more work together, and if we do, we we'll... well, that that that's really good. And so, I mean, what's kind of the future holding now? What are the plans? Are you going you're going to do more work with John, and then are you going to you know do more tours and everything? What's in the pipeline? In the pipeline, I at the moment I'm working on an album with Garadice, our second album. The second album. Hopefully that'll be out mid mid summer next year. Uh, I want to do my own solo album because it's a long time since I've done one of my. It's about two thousand and fourteen, I think, or sixteen, since I did a solo album. So okay. I want to do one again. Uh, tour wise, a few concerts in Ireland in January, February. Then I have the whole month of March into April in Germany. And then later on, I have a few festivals in Denmark and a tour. Yeah. So. Oh, nice. That's nice. Yeah. And it's great because I, I imagine for you during the lockdown, you know, like lots of artists and everything, you were very restricted and it's hard to know what to do with yourself. Maybe you do more art, you do more things like this. But now that we're out of it and hopefully for good, uh, there's a new sense of freedom, isn't there? Oh, absolutely. And it's just fantastic to see audiences back out again and happy and enjoy themselves. And well, I don't not hear they're not wearing masks, which is great because yeah, that even even the mask wearing was stifling for an audience, you know. Do you do you find that in some countries when you go on out there wearing masks? And... No, 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 they're not. No, no some audiences. Yeah. No. OK. Yeah, that would be kind of sad, too. I mean, you sing in your heart out and. It looks like you're singing to a team of immunologists or people with a serious viral illness. Exactly. And then they can't, I love people to sing along. So you can't know if they're singing yeah. along or not, you know, behind these masks. You can't even see their expression. Yes, exactly. <laughs> You'll be like, is that woman in the front row crying or laughing? I don't know. Or is that a yawn? <laughs> <laughs> is that a yawn? Yeah, that's the worst thing, you know. Um, so I think... You know, the thing about it is the the whole pandemic, it made you made us reevaluate things. And I know there's cliches in all of these things we say about the pan- pandemic now. But I think in some ways it made us look at things, pick up new skills, made us look at the skills we have. Do we want to continue them? But I think the main thing, it's kind of like now, you know, whether Christmas coming up and all of these things when people say, oh, I hate Christmas, but it gives us a chance to recharge the batteries. It gives us a chance to step back and look at things, take a little breather. So there was a long breather during the pandemic, but I think we got to reevaluate, didn't we? Oh, yeah. And uh, I think it's a really important thing to reevaluate from time to time. And, you know, we got so lost in all the kind of commercial stuff. And then during the pandemic, you just realize you don't need all this. You don't need to be running all the time. You don't need to be in the car all the time or anything like that. It's just. No, no, you can kind of take it easier. So I'm going to let you go in a second, but I know you promised me you'd do a song. So I'm going to hold you to it. So what song are you going to sing for us? I'm going to do a, a, a song by a songwriter. I adore that's Richard Thompson yeah and because I'm in Balmaslow in Galway I'll do uh, Galway to Graceland a lovely song I love this song yeah it's, it's, it's just it's one of these songs that I really really wish I'd written you know when he describes her flight yeah silver wings carried her over the sea <laughs> yeah the beautiful lyrics beautiful off you go I'll give it a go Simon <laughs> Oh, she dressed in the dark And she whispered amen She was pretty and pink Like a young girl again Twenty years married And she never thought twice She sneaked out the door And walked into the night and silver wings carried her over the sea From the west coast of Ireland to West Tennessee To be with her sweetheart 
Oh, she left everything from Galway to Grayston to be with the king. She was humming suspicion. It's the song she liked best. She had a I love you tattooed on her breast when they landed in Memphis what her heart beat so fast she had dreamed for so long now she'd see him at last she was down by his grave side day after day come close and time to be with her sweetheart Oh, she left everything From nowhere to Graceland To be with the king Ah, they came in their thoughts From the whole human race to pay the respects at his last resting place. Abba Blyg, she knelt And she told him her dreams. And she thought that he answered, or oh, that's how it seems. Then they dragged her away. It was handcuffs this time. She said, my good man, are you out of your mind? Don't you know that we're married? See, I'm wearing his ring. I come from Galway to Graceland to be with the king. I come from Galway to Graceland to be with the king. Really nice, Eleanor. You carry that song so well. It, it's such a fabulous song. Thank you, Simon. But you've such a fabulous voice. It really carries song. it so good. And very nice guitar playing too, I have to say. So good job. Oh. So listen, Eleanor, thank you very much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. If you want to plug any shows or anything that you're coming up, feel free to tell the audience and uh, we'll spread the word, you know? Well, it's been an absolute pleasure, uh, Simon. You'll find shows on www.eleanorshanley.ie. We're doing some with Garadice, some with Mike Canran, the great Mike Canran from Stockton's Wing, and John Feely, and then my own little band are coming to Germany with me. So Brilliant. I'm looking forward to meeting people along the way. I love being back on the road again, and I love doing interviews like this with yourself Simon thank you for taking the time and for singing us a song so not everybody sings so it's nice when people show us their vocal talents like you you know um, thanks a million thank you Eleanor Shanley everybody okay thank you very much Eleanor Shanley it was a pleasure to talk to you and hear about your career and all the many people you've sung with and all the people you've performed over the years amazing and such a great voice and some amazing songs so we wish you the best of luck with the future look forward to hearing more great songs from you thank you very much for coming on the show and thank you the listeners for listening to our podcast and making it more successful so we're so delighted that people are passing on the message about the podcast and we hope you're enjoying the guests and until the next time look after your friends look after your family take care of the people you love my name is simon k this is the collective whisper podcast bye bye